Well, good morning and welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's a good day to rejoice and worship God together. I do want to thank um, our substitute pianist today, Marilyn Klein. She's filling in for Bev as Bev is recovering from surgery. So after the service, make sure you tell Marilyn thanks for all her work for us and everything that she's, she's doing for us this morning. Uh, a job for those sitting on the center row here, the center aisle, the, we've got our fellowship sign-in pads. Love for you to take this, sign in, send it down the aisle, and then once it gets to the end, send it back across, and that way you can see who's seated on your row with you, and uh, we'd love for you to let us know that you're joining us today. Also, I know we are kind of right in the midst of vacation season, so for any that are traveling or just at home uh, joining us for worship, We'd love for you to let us know you're joining us, whether Facebook or YouTube, uh, on the website or in the app. And if you have any prayer requests, please feel free to share those. And maybe let us know where you're joining us from. So it's uh, hopefully maybe you're in a cooler location than we are here. But uh, regardless, we're, we're happy that you're joining us. Uh, well, happy early 4th of July. So this is, uh, this is a fun time of the year. And with 4th of July happening this week, we have an announcement that the prime timers are not going to meet on 4th of July. So any prime timers, y'all get the day off. So celebrate the 4th uh, uh, however you want to, but just not up here at the church because the doors are going to be locked. Um, we also have some mission opportunities. We have our back-to-school drives going on, um, supporting Presbyterian Children's Homes and Services, and also uh, Katie Christian Ministries' Red Apple. If you want any more information, uh, there's a table out by the stairs. And we also have a blood drive coming up that we're hosting at our church. And this isn't just for church members. If you have uh, uh, neighbors that you want to invite to it, uh, they do ask people to sign up because there are certain time slots that they like to reserve. Um, the room will be set up upstairs, and it'll be that morning, that Sunday morning, July 30th, from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. So know that that's happening, and so if you'd like to participate or know someone, please sign up for that. And then that same day, we're planning our fifth Sunday potluck, and uh, we'll continue to get some more information out as we get closer to time. But for now, save the date on that. That'll be a lot of fun. And last announcement that I've got, uh, since it is 4th of July week, also no youth group tonight or Club 45. So that's the announcements for today. How about we stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ? I'll give you a moment to find your, your seats and get your bulletins out, or you can look at the screens above me as we join in our call to worship from Colossians chapter 3. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among us richly as we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As we continue in our worship of God, let us do so, singing America the Beautiful.
seated. And kiddos, if you'll join me at the front for a children's lesson, come on down. It's like our game show. Come on down. You're the next contestant for the children's lesson. All right, y'all come on, come on. Oh, still coming. All right. All right, there you go. Find you a spot. I got something for y'all today. Since it's 4th of July, I've got some bracelets for y'all, so y'all don't let me forget to pass those out after the lesson. So you got to sit through the lesson to get the bracelet. But I do have something for you for right now. Hartley, will you help me out? Will you pass out one of these to each person? Okay. All right. Yeah, each of y'all are going to get a penny. And as you get your penny, I want you to inspect it really well, okay? Yep, you're going you're gonna to look at it, both sides. Study it. Try to see if you can see what's on it, what it says around it. All right. All right, yeah, they over here need some. All right, just a couple more there. There we go. Did everyone get one? Axel needs one? Okay. All right, now did everyone get one? Okay, perfect. Okay, will you all take your penny, and I want you to look at the front of it. Who's on that penny? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Oh, nailed it. You know what else Abraham Lincoln's on? The $5 bill. But that would have been too expensive to pass out $5 bills to you all. So we're going to stick with the penny. I know, I'm so sorry. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. All right, so Abraham Lincoln's on here. What can you tell me about Abraham Lincoln? What, like, no, what number president was he? 16th. 16th, very good. All right, y'all are scholars. He was, he was the 16th president of the United States. Well, why is he on the penny? Why don't we put him on our money? What do you think? Rose, what do you think? He was a very important president. Very good. Charlotte, you have something you want to add? He did. He helped with, with the freedom of slaves. Grace, yeah. And he's your favorite president. Okay, that's a good one to, to end on. Okay, yeah, so Abraham Lincoln, he was a really important president, and so we put his, his picture here on our penny, and he, he helped our country during a really difficult time through the Civil War, and as Charlotte said, he helped to, to free slaves after the Civil War. And it's important to know, what do you, okay, so look on your penny. Look right above his head. What does it say? All right, let's let someone else, someone who has it. Okay, John Caleb. In God we trust. Yeah, and that's really important. That's on all our money. And we know that Abraham Lincoln put his trust in God. One time he gave a speech, and he said, Without the assistance of the divine being, and he meant God there, I cannot succeed. With it, I cannot fail. And so Abraham Lincoln put his trust in God, just like we should put our trust in God, because God gives us strength each and every day, no matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, even if it's a really bad time, but also in the good times as well. We can always put our trust in God, knowing that God will guide us and direct us. Will you all pray with me? God, we thank you for uh, this day and this season where we celebrate our freedom and the strength that you give us through your spirit. I ask that you keep us uh, safe this week and let us just celebrate your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before y'all run off, I got stuff for y'all. Okay. All right, I want y'all to take a bracelet and then you can head to Faith Express. Hey, jeez, jeez. What's going on here? USA, yeah. USA. There you go. Here, I'm going to give the rest to Miss Jessica and she'll make sure that everyone gets a bracelet. That one there. All right, and for the rest of us, how about we stand and we'll sing our next song together?
confession, praying with one voice and confessing our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Holy God, your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is relentless, passionate and astounding. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus, which has redeemed us and restored us to a right relationship with you. We confess that we take this gift for granted. We fail to grasp the significance of the sacrifice. We continue to live as unredeemed people. Forgive us of our sinfulness. Cleanse us, restore us and ignite our hearts with a passion to live for you, we humbly ask in Jesus' name. Let's take the next few moments in silence for prayers of personal confession. Holy God, for all the ways we have ignored you and turned from you, Lord, we say that we are sorry. We place our sin before you that you would remove them from us and free us to live wholeheartedly for you. Help us to live into the freedom that we have in you. And we pray, guide us, correct us, and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hear these words of assurance from Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. This Spirit he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope that we have of eternal life. Friends, it's in the name of Christ that we are forgiven and set free. That is something to praise and rejoice in. So let us do so standing and singing together.
we are continuing our series on virtues, those life principles and practice that ought to serve as the framework which gives strength and shape and stability to our lives. And we are to build this framework, as we've said in weeks past, on the firm foundation that is Christ. We've talked about uh, the virtues that the early church had called the four cardinal virtues. We talked about justice, that is fairness and goodness. We talked about prudence, using good judgment and wisdom, fortitude, living with strength and perseverance and courage, and temperance, displaying moderation and self-control. And last week we looked at two more virtues, integrity, and we talked about how integrity is something that is forged over time. And it's put to the test mostly in, in two ways. One, under stressful conditions. You know, when we, we see what something or something is made of when it's put under, under stressful conditions. And the other way it's put to the test is when there's no accountability at all. Uh, like the quote, integrity is what one does when no one is watching. So those are, those are two ways that we talked about uh, integrity being tested. But we also talked about that uh, how integrity, while it's something that's forged over time, it's also something that can be compromised in an instant. And after integrity, we talked about purity. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul said, you were taught with, your former, with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul tells us in Ephesians that we are to be imitators of God, to live as children of the light who put our old self and our sinful ways behind us and strive to live into the new life as we reflect Christ. Well, today I'm going to break the pattern that we've, we've done over the last two weeks and not talk necessarily about any one specific virtue, but rather how virtues come from freedom. Since this is Fourth of July kind of weekend, I wanted to, to focus on this idea of liberty and freedom today. Uh, before our reading, uh, and our reading will be in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, and then skipping to verse 13 and going to verse 25. But before we read, let us pray. Gracious God, amid all the changing uh, times that we find ourselves, we ask that you would speak your eternal word that does not change. Lord, grant us humble and teachable and obedient hearts, that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Lord, help us to respond to your gracious promises with, with faithful and obedient lives through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'm going to start Galatians chapter 5 with just one verse, verse 1, and then we'll discuss before moving on. Paul writes, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. One of the things that I mentioned last week was that uh, how this weekend, where we currently find ourselves, uh, marks the anniversary of one of the most famous battles of the American Civil War. The Battle of Gettysburg took place from July 1st to July 3rd, 1863. So, meaning that if we were to go back in time, find a time machine and go back exactly 160 years to that field in Pennsylvania, we would be right in the middle of the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, something that I did not mention last week is that a few months after that battle, the field on which it was fought was established as a national cemetery. And in November of that year, 1863, President Lincoln traveled to the site for the dedication of that cemetery. And it was then that Lincoln gave his famous Gettysburg Address. I don't know if you know this, but his address was only 10 sentences long. It's 272 words if you count them. It took less than two minutes to give. But they are some of the most immortalized words in American history. And I won't read it all. But uh, how it begins, I'm sure, comes to mind. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 
Lincoln's understanding of the war was one that was based upon principles of virtue. He believed that our nation was one conceived in liberty, and it promoted liberty's cause that all men are created equal. For Lincoln, that battle and all the battles in the Civil War were worth fighting for that greater purpose and cause. Well, spiritually, we find ourselves on a battlefield each and every day. It's an ongoing struggle for us. And if you remember last week as we were looking at Ephesians chapter 4, we saw how Paul creates this dichotomy between the old self and the new self. The old self, he says, is defined by the flesh. It seeks to satisfy its own selfish desires, but the new self is defined not by the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. We are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, today in Galatians 5, as we will see as we continue on, we'll see Paul again contrasting uh, between flesh and spirit, between sinfulness and righteousness, between vices and virtues, between slavery and freedom. Again, he writes, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So let us stand firm then and do not let ourselves be burned again by the yoke of slavery. Galatians has has been called the epistle of liberty. And obviously we haven't read much of Galatians at all yet. We've only looked at one verse. But I can tell you the central issue at the heart of Galatians is this issue of of righteousness. Righteousness, Paul explains, it's not the the result of works or of following the law, but simply and primarily and fundamentally on faith in Christ. What Paul teaches is that righteousness, it's not about performing a checklist of actions, but it's about freely and gratefully embracing Jesus Christ in faith. In Christ, we have freedom from any kind of works-based righteousness because no one can be made righteous through their works anyway. And if the Galatians had even tried to do that, Paul says that they, they would be shackling themselves into spiritual slavery instead of embracing the freedom that they have in Christ because Christ sets us free. Well, legalism and kind of what Paul is talking about there is, is one side of the equation, but there's another side. And we're going to pick up with the, our text now with verse 13, and I'm just going to read from 13 to 15. Paul continues, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. That famous 16th century reformer, Martin Luther, he was greatly affected, impacted by the words of Galatians. I mean, it, it, it was one of the most significant texts, if not the most significant text that fueled Luther and his theology and his work and, and really the whole Reformation. Because we know that uh, the year prior to Luther nailing his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg in uh, 1517, we know that in October of 1516, Luther began lecturing through Galatians for a number of months. And after that famous time, uh, account where uh, Luther nailed those 95 theses to the door, just, just that uh, next year or two later, he would again lecture through Galatians. And not only that, a year after that in 1520, Luther published a pamphlet and he titled it, On the Freedom of the Christian." It's almost like those words that Luther just saturated himself in Galatians continued to work through him and and in him and through him. And he kept coming back to them again and again and expounding upon them. And they were were fuel for him. They they gave him life because in them he found freedom. And so he he writes this this little pamphlet on the freedom of the Christian. And I want to read just the very first lines of the pamphlet and then from the very last lines where he gives his conclusion. So Luther begins, he says, point one, it's, it's split up into 30 points. I'm not going to read all 30, but this is just part of point one. He says, he, or he begins, I want to set forth two theses so that we may have a fundamental understanding 
of what a Christian is and what was done to attain this freedom that Christ has won for him and given to him, about which St. Paul has written a good deal. And these are his, his two points here. A Christian is a free Lord of everything and subject to no one. A Christian is a willing servant of everything and subject to everyone. You might think that sounds kind of contradictory. <laughs> What's Luther saying there? What Luther meant by this and, and what he would go on to explain in all these other points is essentially the same thing that Paul's talking about in Galatians chapter 5. That by God's sheer grace, through the gift of faith, we are made completely free in Christ. There is no power over the Christian other than God. That's what, Paul's, or what Luther's getting at in his first uh, part of that. But in the second part, he says, our freedom in Christ also means that we have the freedom not just to harbor it for ourselves, but we have the freedom to serve others just as Christ was free and just as Christ served us. So that this gift of grace that we receive freely, we freely gift to others just as Christ did. And Luther ends his work, so this is down in point 30, and he says, from all of this comes the conclusion that a Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and in his neighbor, in Christ through faith, in the neighbor through love. Through faith, he rises above himself in God. From God, he descends under himself through love and, always remain, or, and remains always in God and in divine love. Behold, that is the proper spiritual Christian freedom, which liberates the heart from all sins, laws, and commands. This freedom exceeds all other freedoms. As high as heaven, as heaven is over the earth, may God grant us that we truly understand that and retain it. Amen. That's how he ends his, his pamphlet there. We are to live in Christ through faith. Christ has set us free, but we are also to live for our neighbors in love. That's the idea, Luther's idea of what Christian freedom is. It's living in Christ through faith and serving our neighbors in love. We know that freedom is a wonderful gift, but it's also a great responsibility to, to cherish it and to live it out with the utmost care as we, as we serve others. As Paul says, you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. And in that we say, yeah, we're called to be free. But Paul goes and he says, but you're not to use that freedom just to indulge in the flesh and selfish behavior in yourself. Rather, you're to use that freedom to serve one another humbly in love. I found a commentary on Galatians 5 that I thought was particularly insightful for today. Uh, it comes from Philip Ryken, who's a Presbyterian minister and currently the president of Wheaton College. And he, he says this, and if you'll bear with me, it's a, a paragraph or too long. But I, thought, I think it's really good and relevant. He says, liberty must always be defended from its two great enemies, legalism and license. To this point, Paul has been fighting against legalism. This was his concern at the beginning of chapter 5. There is another threat to liberty, however, and that is license. License is loose living. It is freedom taken to its immoral extreme. The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as a liberty of action, especially when excessive disregard of law or uh, propriety, abuse of freedom. Whereas legalism demands responsibility without freedom, license grants freedom without responsibility. Everyone wants to be free. It's a free country, Americans like to say. The trouble comes whenever and wherever there is freedom without responsibility. Unfortunately, this is precisely what most people want. The Apostle Paul understood that license poses as great a threat to liberty as legalism does. Hence his brotherly warning, for you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. The Galatians had been liberated from legalism, but they were not to use their liberty as an opportunity for license. That message still holds true for us. 
And it's something that our founding fathers understood well, that if we, are go, if we were going to be a free society, that does not mean that everyone can just do whatever they want. It's like, yay, we're free, we're just going to do whatever we want. That's not, that does not promote the cause of freedom and liberty. The preamble to the Constitution reads, We the people of the United States... In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And it begins with the word we. We the people. It means that we are binding ourselves to one another. We're not living just wholly for ourselves. We're living in a community, in a society, with and for one another. So being free requires honoring and protecting and defending not only our rights, but the rights and well-beings of others. Freedom is a responsibility to the other. Which, yeah, I, know, I know we kind of maybe all sense this as Americans, we're We're very individualistic people. We take a lot of pride in independence. Independence, I mean, it's sort of a part of our DNA. It's it's our American ethos. We, you know, one of the most celebrated documents we have is the Declaration of Independence. But I think our, our sinful nature, we want autonomy. We just want to do what we want. We just want to take care of ourselves. We don't want to rely on anyone else. We just want what's best for us. Well, in two days, we'll celebrate Independence Day. And the direct relation of independence has these famous lines. That we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When our founding fathers voted to ratify this document, it was a vote for liberty. It was a vote for freedom. But it was not a liberty without cost. There was bloodshed for the cause of freedom. Similarly, our spiritual freedom is not without cost. Because Christ took the war upon himself for us. He sacrificed with his blood on the cross and rose again in victory so that we could have freedom in his name. But again, our freedom is not just a license to indulge in ourselves or infringe upon the freedoms and rights of others. Rather, Christian freedom sets us free to live and to love as Christ did. We are set free in Christ If we are set free in Christ, though, how are we to live? How do we go about that? And this is, I think, where Paul goes to answer this question in verses 16 through 25. So Paul picks up after after creating this dichotomy, and he says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. How are we to live being set free in Christ? Paul says we live by walking in the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, living by the Spirit of Christ. In other words, giving our declaration of dependence on God. We are to depend on the Spirit to guide us and to strengthen us, to lead us, to empower us, or to willingly follow the Spirit 
And through that, that following of the Spirit, through our lives of discipleship, God's Spirit produces godly virtue, virtues within us. Virtues like he, he lists, we call them the fruit of the Spirit, but they're virtues. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Notice that Paul doesn't go in and say, okay, this one, and gives like a long lecture about it. This one. He says, if you want this fruit, walk by the Spirit. Focus on serving Christ alone. And these things will just naturally be produced from your life. I like what Luther says about these virtues. This is in one of his lectures on Galatians. He says, Paul does not call these works of the Spirit, but gives them the nobler designation of fruits, because those who have them give glory to God, and by their virtues point others to the teaching and faith of Christ. As Christians, we are to declare our dependence upon Christ and walk in the freedom that he's given us. Because as we strive to live each day in, with gospel-centered lives, those virtues will naturally be produced within us. But we need to remember that those virtues just aren't for our own, you know, be, uh, puffing up ourselves, saying, well, I'm so virtuous now. Those virtues are fruit. They're to be shared. They're to be received by others that others may taste and see that the Lord is good. So how are you walking in the Spirit? I want to encourage you this week as you celebrate, you know, freedom as an American. Celebrate your freedom in Christ. That's most important of all. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have in your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, who was risen in power for us, who continues to reign over us. Lord, guide us, protect us, strengthen us to walk in your ways, Lord, that we would embody your image, your likeness, your character. Lord, that we would live lives of virtue, not for ourselves, but Lord, that others may taste and see that you alone are good. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation in need of prayer. We pray for Judy Lacey's family and David Forche's family as they mourn loss. We pray for Meg Irwin's father, Scott, and Nick and Ann Bailey. Continued prayers for George Puig and Barb Thornley, Karen Benedict and Frank and Marilyn Poiskey. Also for Jim and Sandy Lee Hamilton, Claren McCoy and Bev Warner. Lord, we thank you so much that you love us. And Lord, help us to live in that love, free in your name. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's continue in worship with the time of offering.
Our freedom is not free. Our spiritual freedom was paid for by the blood of Christ. And this table is an invitation for all who put their trust in Christ to come and be nourished by his spirit, to be strengthened in him, that we may live for him, declaring his good news to all people. What begins at baptism is nourished and sustained here with this meal. Will you all pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this time, this opportunity that we can gather together as one people. Lord, to share communion with one another, but communion with you, for we know that your spirit is with us. Lord, bless us during this time. May it nourish our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night before Jesus died, he was at table with his disciples, and he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, for as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the death of our risen Savior until he comes again. The bread this morning is gluten-free, that's a concern for you, and also uh, we've got the juice in the cups. We ask that you take a cup of the bread and the juice and take it with you to your seat and just hold it until everyone has been served, and then we will partake together. I'm going to invite Kimber to come forward and assist me at the front. All is ready. The ushers will, will guide you as they come forward.
the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us stand together, and as we do, we'll sing the Lord's Prayer. Hope you enjoy your 4th of July this year, and as we celebrate our freedom that we enjoy in this country, let us also celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ. So I pray that uh, you have a safe week, a fun week, an exciting week, but uh, remember to take time to pray and to give thanks to God for the freedom we have. So may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and all your days. Go in peace. Amen. Hallelujah.